This is the second of five short videos on aspects of Ingleborough through the centuries. This is a very similar cairn to the one you've just seen, except this is not commemorating anybody. And the figure there on the right is giving it some kind of scale. It's, there's no way that could have stood like that for, for hundreds of years. It is, in fact, a fairly modern, and I can't define fairly modern more tightly than that, um, cairn of some kind of mark, a pile of stones, whatever you want to call it. But this is almost certainly built out of a burial cairn. So it's... It's had a, a complete makeover against its wishes. This is overlooking, as you can see there, you've got one side in the distance, so it's overlooking the valley of Chapel of Dale and Twistleton Scars across the valley. This is a different kind of cairn. This is uh, near Ribblehead. It's quite near to the Ribblehead Quarry. And the blue arrows there are pointing to two smallish mounds. If you look at the one at the bottom left first of all, you can see that the the vegetation is slightly different colour, there's a lot more moss, there are stones in an in a amorphous heap there, and the top right arrow towards the wall is a rather larger mound, but it's very similar to that. These are not burial mounds, these are what are called field clearance cairns. They're probably late Bronze Age, and it's when the people living around here were trying to improve the pasture by clearing as many stones as they could and just heaping them up at the nearest possible point. So these are good examples of field clearance cairns. And there's some other very good ones just on the north side of the B Road, just to the west of the viaduct. There's, there's dozens and dozens of them there. Up on Gorber High Pasture, you've got Ingleborough there in the background with its dramatic view. The blue arrow there is pointing to, again, a very low mound you can probably think well it's no different from the rest of what you can see there but it's very hard to take a decent photo when you've got such ve long vegetation but this is a denuded sort of truncated burial cairn above the the so-called viking settlement and if you scramble up onto where the blue arrow is pointing to then there is this small what's called a stone kist now that marker there as it says is 200 meter 200 millimeters in length so about eight inches in in length so that little stone box if you like it's got a stone floor dry stone wall sides and it would have had a stone cap on top it's a kist it's where there was a burial it could have been a cremation burial somebody you know, put into a, a burial urn and covered over, or it could have been a small person, it's just over a metre long, could have been a small person buried in the crouch position. But this is one of the best examples that I've seen anyway in the Dales of a, of a kist. It's lost its cap, obviously, but it's a, a kist, more or less as it was made, what, 3,000 years ago? Could be Bronze Age, it could be Late Bronze Age, I mean Early Bronze Age, it could be late Neolithic. This is on the western side of the hill um, near Spice Gill. You've got Spice Gill and so the scales off up to the top left of the picture, off the picture. And this is a, a circle of stones. It's what is almost probably what's called a ring cairn by archaeologists. So somebody, and it would have been somebody rather than some bodies, would have been buried in there and that somebody would have been uh, a more important person than the hoi polloi like me. And again, it could have been a cremation burial. It could have just been an inter um, a crouch burial. We don't know. It's not, well, as far as we know, it's not been excavated. But it's it would not have been covered over. It would just have had a, the ring would have been more structured than it is now. Obviously, over a couple of thousand, three thousand years, it's got denuded and livestock have pushed the stones out. But that's a pretty good example of what we call a ring cairn. These are two different heaps of stone, if you want to call them that. Both of these are burial cairns. Both of them are of the style that's typical of the Bronze Age. So that on the scale bar there, each section on the scale bar is half a metre. So you can see it's about, it's less than a half, one and a half metres in diameter, 
the one on the right without the scale bar is about the same. And you've got stones piled up and you've got on the one on the top, on the, the right hand, the, sorry, the left hand picture, you've got a lot of moss. And a lot of these burial cairns, they have moss, whereas cairns that aren't burial cairns and the surrounding land don't have the moss. So there must be some chemical signature there in the ground that's making such a profusion of moss. And this kind of cairn, and the one on the right, has definitely been reworked. You can see the different colour of the stone. Somebody's piled it up, either, I don't know, passing the time of day or to make it a marker cairn. But they have been partly reworked. But this kind of cairn, you find them by the score all across the dales and other areas. This, I guess that's a metre, that scale bar there. This is a tiny one. It's on Mouton. And it's a completely limestone landscape up there. So the bedrock, which you can see on the right and the, and the left of the pile of stones, is all limestone. But if you look carefully, most of the stone in that heap of stones is not limestone. It's virtually all sandstone. Very different texture, surface texture, very different colour, very different density. And it's a characteristic of all these burial cairns across Ingleborough and elsewhere that they, whoever they were who built them and put somebody in there, wanted to make a contrast between the, the native stone, the, the limestone, and the cairn itself. A sort of contrast in texture, contrast in colour. As you see, if you've been to um, Nouth in near Dublin, massive contrast in stone there between the white and the, and the rest of the grey wacky. This is the same one in context looking northwards towards Mouton Long or Mouton Scar. Very insignificant. It's not. A lot of these cairns are in very prominent positions or rather prominent positions. This one isn't. It's just they're plonked on a rather flat-ish plateau. And this is a very different kind of burial mound. That's one side in the background. So this is on the area called Keld Bank. So if you climb over it and, and drop down the other side, you will come down to the main footpath from the uh, Hill Inn going up to Ingleborough. This is what's called a long mound or in technical jargon, if you like, a short long barrow. It's a long barrow that's on the short side. You can see rather massive limestone boulders there. You've got that long mound. It's roughly 24 metres long and it's roughly 14 metres wide and it's about one and a half metres high above the surrounding surface. It's in plan, it's oval shape. This is an area near Southern Scales. You've got the old Southern Scales farm in the top left there. It's Doubt Cave pasture taking up the eastern half of it. Each of those little grey turtles is a burial cairn like the ones I showed in the earlier slides. They're all small. They're all almost certainly early Bronze Age. And there's a strong relationship between those cairns. I would suggest there's a strong relationship between those cairns and several caves, prominent caves. So you've got Great Doubt Cave up in the top right. You've got Hard Rock in Pot there shown marked in the middle of the map, which is a very dramatic pothole. And there's another one which is not marked on here, but it's on that diagonal wall running sort of from the centre right to centre bottom, which is called Knacker Trappers. So you've got those three prominent caves. You've got areas of limestone pavement shown there, and there's got to be a strong relationship between the cairns and those potholes. And we'll come back to that in a minute. The Where it says track going up to the top if you followed that track you would come to the Keld Bank Long Mound so that just puts it in its locational context. That's the top of the Long Mound Cairn. If you stand on top you think well 
what's the difference between that and the surrounding area, but you lose the vertical definition. But you've got several, three big stones there, big three big limestone pieces, and you can see there's quite a prominent, let's call it an excavation there, running across it and where I was standing to take this picture, there's another one. So there are two excavations there, former excavations there, both of which are probably Victorian, both of which are probably by antiquarians, and both of them probably just seeking quote-unquote treasure. This is the plan of the Kelbank Long Cairn, drawn by members of the Ingerbrough Ecology Group, led by Yvonne Luke, and the stippled area in the middle, sort of, oh, well, is one of the excavations. The dashed dotted area below that is the other of the two excavations, and the tadpoles going out indicate the length and the steepness of the slope. On the bottom right there, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a structure which is was some kind of enclosure, which um, is probably connected with the cairn in some way, but we can't say more than that. We can't say what, in what way it was connected in some way. Leave it at that. So this is a long cairn like this, or a short long barrel, whatever you want to call it, is probably late Neolithic. So it's very different from these later, smaller, circular Bronze Age mounds. What the OS maps used to mark as tumuli, tumulus or tumuli. This is going back to Doubt Cave Pasture, where the archaeology group has surveyed 33 of these small cairns in quite a small area, as shown on that previous map, which didn't show all of them, by the way. Um, I've talked about the significance of the caves. Um, of these 33, 15 are more or less circular, 18 are oval. Two of them, like this one, have a longer, long axis. And again, that's a two metre two meter scale bar altogether. But what we've got here is three prominent boulders, which look as though they're earth fast, but they're not limestone. They're all sandstone. So they are part of the cairn. And if you, whether they, they might have had four originally, but if you imagine those two nearer the camera as standing upright before they fell, stick a big slab on top, put your burial, whether it's cremation or inhumation, inside, and then cover the whole thing over with soil, you've got uh, a burial cairn. This one has been completely robbed out as with Kelbank, probably by Victorian antiquarians looking for treasure. If we move over to White Scars, which is on the southwestern corner of the Ingleby Massif, above Kriner Bottom, the grey blobs again there are cairns, so there's what, one, two, three, four cairns shown on there, lots of limestone pavement exposed, You've got lead mine moss on the right, just below the arcs. And then you've got a series of green diamond shapes. Those are, as in the title, those are placed stones, what we call placed stones or stone settings. And if you look at the bottom, towards the bottom left, there are two cairns and four settings. If you look towards the centre right, there's one cairn and three or four settings. And if you look towards the top left, there's one cairn and three settings. And then centre top is the word cairn and one setting very close. And right in the centre of the plan, there's another where it says cairn with a setting not far away to its right. Now, these stone settings. This is research that's only been going on, understories in stone, over the past, well, less than two years. We've had groups out surveying across 20 limestone pavements around Ingrubba, surveying all these stone settings, these place stones, and looking at the relationship between them, the landscape and burial cairns. And this is where, you know, ritual for sure comes into it. There's got to be some connection. And there are cases elsewhere on the pavements we've looked at where you've got lines of stone settings clearly 
aligned on a cairn. So here's three examples of stone settings. They're all big. They're all, without exception, distinctively shaped. I mean, the one on the top right and the one at the bottom are really weird shapes. So whoever put them there went to a lot of trouble to find stones with really distinctive profiles. There's no way they just slipped off and dropped down into the grikes. There's no way that ice came along, upended them, moved them laterally through 90 degrees and dropped them down the grikes. They have definitely been put there by people. The one on the top left shows a lot of lichen, white lichen, blackish lichen and orange lichen. And I got very excited putting this together thinking there's got to be some significance with the white and the orange lichen because not all the stones have them. In fact, uh, an expert lichenologist, Dr. Alan Pentecost, concluded, well he didn't, didn't conclude, he knew that the only significance of the orange is that that is where birds have been perching and pooing and those orange and yellow lichens colonise bird poo. Two figures there. I'm on the far distance. I'm standing next to a small burial cairn. The person who took the photo is standing next to another small burial cairn on a limestone pavement about two metres higher than that one and connecting the top burial cairn, in other words the camera, with the person on the right and me. You can't really figure it out. You can't really see it there. But there is a discontinuous line of these stone settings. Not a straight line but a curving line. Some of them have fallen over. Some of them are partially, partially leaning and some are still upright. But they've, it's clear from close examination on the ground that they were put there to connect the one cairn to the other. Now, don't ask me why they didn't go in a straight line. You can't answer that question. But was that done so that whoever was buried in burial cairn one could commune with whoever was buried where I'm standing through those stones. Is it some kind of way that people in the past who thought in very different ways from how we do that ancestors could communicate with ancestors? The A lot of the burial cairns, the smaller burial cairns, these round ones and the settings, they're associated with limestone pavement or with caves or with fissures. So is this... Is this where liminality comes in, where we think of heaven being up in the sky, or on the cloud, I don't know, and we look up there to the past, to our God. People in the past, prehistorians will tell you, a lot of prehistorians will tell you, that in prehistory they didn't look up there to the gods, they looked down there. So were these the grikes in the pavements, the fissures, the sinkholes, the potholes, the caves, were they conduits to enable people living, living at the time to communicate with the dead, with the ancestors, with the spirits, with the gods? This is where liminality comes in. Are these liminal places, places, liminal means sort of on the edge, in between, Again, it's quite a difficult concept to get your head around and some people would poo-poo it and that's their prerogative. But the fact we've got 20 pavements around Ingleborough all with these stones, either in a line, singly or in arrangements and perhaps more interestingly that work as a spin-off from our surveys here on the limestone pavements in Westmoreland, Crosby Garrett, Great Asby, Little Asby and so on. You've got exactly the same situation there. These big stones, shaped, not shaped, naturally shaped stones. There's something clearly important here. And this, there's a burial cairn on the skyline there towards the left. There's the line of fallen stones. You can see them just in front of the ranging pole. You've got some behind it, one still standing. That there's a line of stones that slightly curves. It's eight metres long and you can't see it. But beyond that, there's another line 
that's eight meters long where you've got on top of the granites you've got little collections of sandstone pebbles that has not all happened by accident they've not got in there by accident by the weather by ice by animals kicking it by people burying sheep or anything like that there is some aspect here of otherworldliness of ritual <laughs> <laughs>